Good morning, everyone from First Baptist Church, friends and guests. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. I hope you're doing well at home. I hope you're all safe inside and warm and protected from this inclement weather that we're having. Um, I don't know if you know, but on March 4th, something really incredible happened. Our pastor, Len Billings, uh, had his defense of his oral uh, orals on his dissertation, and he passed with flying colors, uh, no revisions, which is a very, very big deal. And we're celebrating with him during this month. We're going to have a special recognition for him on the 28th of March. And if you're able, we'd like to have you all come out so we can tell Lynn, uh, good job, appreciate your hard works and your efforts. So we'd like to do that. Before we get started, I'd like to start prayer for our passage this morning. So let's, let's pray, please, together. Our Father in heaven, you are the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipotent God who can do everything. And we bow before you this morning and we recognize you and we hallow your name. We come to, before you to break the word. We ask that you would help us do that in an effective way ask that you'd break my words small and that we would be able to eat them and put them in our bodies and in our feet and in our hands and apply them in the world and that we would live out lives that are questionable to the world because of the application of the scripture. So thank you for this time and this opportunity in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to read from Luke chapter 7 verses 36 through 39 to start. It says, Now one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him. He entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. And standing behind him at his feet, Weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with her hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him that she is a sinner. Well, we have two men here in this text. Both men have good reputations. One is defined as a fundamentalist, one who follows the law strictly. He knows exactly what he believes. It's either right or it's wrong. In his view, there's only one, two shades, black and white, there's never any gray. He invites a man with a good reputation, and this man is almost the opposite. He's a revolutionary. He is counterculture. He sees the world in a total prism of colors and lives by inviolable principles of unconditional love, unconditional acceptance, and unconditional forgiveness. The fundamentalist has already judged the revolutionary in a rigid fashion and doesn't have much time for his nonsense. He invited him to dinner not to extend the social graces and social courtesies of their culture, not to welcome him to their community and to give him the right hand of fellowship. No, he brought him in a place that was caustic, where he could in a sense, kind of shun the other because he didn't welcome him, nor did he welcome his message of love. The fundamentalist doesn't like the revolutionary because he breaks the laws of the Jewish Sabbath. He has the audacity to heal people on the Sabbath. Doesn't he know that there's six days in the week when he can heal people? But no, he insists that he has to heal people on the Sabbath. And it just drives the fundamentalist Pharisee crazy. He also associates with immoral people, publicans, sinners, tax collectors, 
people who the law staunchly instruct that the righteous should avoid and not to spend time with them. William Barclay says, the scene is of a dinner. It's in the courtyard of the house of Simon the Pharisee. The houses of the well-to-do people were built around an open court, uh, courtyard in the form of a hollow square. And inside this uh, square would be a garden and a fountain. And the people would mingle around and they would recline at table there. Often, uh, rabbis did not have any association with women in public. They would not spend time with this woman who came. They would not eat with her. She's allowed in the courtyard, but that's all. She's not allowed in his house. She ha he has no respect for her and wants to keep his distance from her. Not only is Simon the Pharisee hosting a revolutionary with a reputation of looking at things differently, but there in the garden, standing directly above his outstretched legs, is this immoral woman who makes her living probably as a prostitute. And Simon, the fundamentalist, is appalled. She starts to lower her body down upon Jesus' feet. She is crying uncontrollably, and her tears are dripping on his feet. Doesn't the revolutionary Jesus, who is touching him, because she has an unclean reputation, and she is touching this rabbi. She is making him unclean according to the law. This woman is breaking all the rules. For a Jewish woman to appear with her hair unbound was an act of gravest immodesty. On her wedding day, all upright Jewish girls would bound their hair up and would never again have their hair unbound in public. It was a picture that the hair was something only for the husband, and she was going to bound it up and separate herself from those who are immoral to tell to her husband that she is dedicated to him. But this immoral woman could care less about her hair. It's always unbound. In fact, it's the thing that's maybe the most attractive about her and the thing in which the dirty men of society like the most. Why would she ever put her hair up? It's something that she does. And she is using her hair at this time to dry Jesus' feet. The feet in the Jewish culture were considered dirty because the roads were only dusty tracks, paths filled with dirt and dust. And the shoes were merely soles held in place by straps across the feet. So dust and dirt and mud got it between the toes and on the feet always. When one went to someone's house, someone usually would wash the feet of the visitor. That was expected. In the East, the guests did not sit, but they reclined at table. They lay low on couches, resting on their left elbow and leaving their right arm free in order to drink and to eat. And their feet were stretched out behind them. And during the meals, the sandals were taken off. And usually the feet of one guest was right in the nose of another. And uh, they were had the opportunity of smelling feet uh, during the meal. So it was important that the feet were washed and cleaned. But the fundamentalist Simon is beside himself because Jesus certainly has no clue who is touching him, even if he's supposed to become and declared a prophet. What type of spectacle is he causing for the other guests? He's supposed to be a prophet, and he doesn't even know the situation. He's associating with someone the culture demands that they separate from. If nothing could be more shocking, she takes 
little flask of concentrated perfume. It's called an alabaster. They were very costly at the time. And she begins to anoint his feet with this expensive perfume. In the mind of the Pharisee, the revolutionary Jesus is already charged. He's condemned. He's sentenced in the Pharisee's mind as a lawbreaker. He's on the level of the woman who is touching him. What can a man like that teach a Pharisee of the law? Jesus, the revolutionary, interrupts the fundamentalist thoughts by saying, Simon, I have something to say to you. In this Jewish culture, as in many cultures today, the way to instruct and teach principles is by the telling of a story. And Jesus did this all the time in telling a story and then shooting directly into the heart of the person who's listening the point of the whole story. And he does this effectively in Luke chapter 7. Let's look at that at verse 41, and I'll read the story all the way down to verse 50. It says, a money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one who forgave more. And he said to him, you've judged correctly. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. She has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Those who were at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. By means of this story, Jesus is stating to Simon the Pharisee, don't you assume that a person is irredeemable because she fails the cultural standard. She may not be clean by the world's culture because she associates with dirty men. She does dirty activities. But all of her dirt doesn't indicate what her heart is like. And I look at the heart, not the externals. On the other hand, the Pharisee is well-dressed, associates with those who are considered clean and pure, but his heart is filled with arrogance, pride, and unbelief. The response of the prostitute is much more righteous than the response of the fundamentalist Pharisee. The Pharisee's heart is hard and doesn't do the minimum that the culture expected. He was rude and crude to his guest, Jesus. When a guest entered a house of the host, especially a house of a rabbi Pharisee, that rabbi would do three things, and he would always do them. The first thing he would do is he'd place his hands on the guest's shoulders. He would look him in the eye, and he'd welcome him to his home with kind words and gentle courtesies. And then he would kiss him on the cheek. This Pharisee did none of those things. However, the woman of ill repute continually kissed Jesus' feet. Because the roads were dusty and oftentimes muddy, a visitor would have his feet washed by a servant or someone in the house. And they would pour cool water over the feet 
rub them and wash them and make sure that they were clean and stimulate the feet with the servant's hands, which would be a comfort to them. The woman with unbound hair used her hair as a cloth. And after the feet were soaked with her tears, she rubbed and circulated the, the feet and brought them back to life, which was probably very pleasing to Jesus at this time. Then the servant of the house would take a pinch of sweet-smelling incense, which was burned. Then he would drop it on the head of the person, or he would take um, a drop of adder of roses, and it was placed on the guest's head. So he'd have this prophematic smell accompanying him during the time that he's eating. That's what the good manners of the society demanded. And in this case, the Pharisee didn't do any of them. The prostitute, on the other hand, didn't worry about the expense of soothing Christ's feet. She took an alabaster vial of expensive perfume. The Gospel of Mark and John say that she probably paid 300 denarii for that perfume, which is about a year's wage. So it cost a lot, $70,000 in today's coinage to buy that perfume. And that wasn't an issue for the woman. She anointed his feet with graciousness and thanksgiving. Both sinned, but only one was repentant. The Pharisee was repugnant. Although forgiveness was offered, it was only received by the humble, repentant woman that was seeking for forgiveness. But forgiveness found no room in the heart of the proud Pharisee. The fundamentalist can only receive the other that is just like him, the, the one that follows his rules, the one that seeks his, his idea of what Scripture is saying. Jesus, on the other hand, receives anyone who approaches him in humility, repentance, and faith. The fundamentalist approach to Jesus was with arrogance and doubt, and therefore he remained separated from salvation and forgiveness. The woman was embraced by both of these. How can we le le learn Jesus? How can we understand what he taught and apply it into our lives? How can we live questionable lives as Jesus lived? And so when he enters a situation, people are drawn to him because of his lifestyle. How can we do that? Well, the first thing we can do is not put people in a box and not consider by the way they look and the way they act, this is who they are. Jesus never put people in a box. He allowed them to define who they were by their actions, their words, and their deeds. And then he judged them accordingly. Jesus did not allow culture to determine who a person was. You see, culture has been defined by the statement, that's the way we do things around here. That's culture. It's our norms. It's our values. It's how we treat people. It's how we interact with them. And each culture has their own way of doing these various things. Some, some expression of cultures are neutral. They're not good or bad. I can shake your hand to greet you, or I can give you a kiss on the cheek. That's a neutral expression. It's not sinful at all. Sometimes culture does have norms and values that are sinful, that are expressed in public. We hear the word of racism a lot today. He's a racist. She's a racist. And we have been. And racism is a sin but we have transmitted that through our cultural, our cultural norms and values for years. And if Jesus were here, he would transform that. He would, um, he would check that. He would talk about that in a lot of ways, I'm sure. There's three ways that we can relate to culture. We can identify with culture. 
We can separate from it or we can transform it. Jesus in this parable is a transformative agent. He confronts through a story Simon's lack of sensitivity and he nails him to the wall because he didn't act in a biblical way. He acted in a cultural way, but he was way out of line. Jesus doesn't view this situation through the lens of culture. He doesn't assume the person is irredeemable because she has failed the cultural standard. He doesn't stamp the woman by her outward appearance. He makes no assumption about who she is because of her appearance and vocation. He allows the woman to divine herself by her faith and actions. And he welcomes her with open arms into his presence because she is humble and has a repentant heart. When Jesus sees a soft heart, he responds with arms wide open and with compassion. There is no cultural bias in his response. He doesn't consider her immorality. He sees her interest in being forgiven. And that's the most important thing to Jesus. He looks at the Pharisee's heart, and he sees a hard heart. And he challenges him to a life of transformation. Often, Jesus challenged cultural norms. He just didn't go with the flow. He separated from people who were proud and arrogant and received and refused to receive his message. Not because he wanted to, but he knew that they would not change. And therefore, he gave them the privilege of having their own choice and he separated from them. Often he identified with culture and he tried to please the cultural norms. He's at the wedding in Canaan and it's the last day. It's the end of the party, the feast, the wedding, and they're out of wine. What does he do? He turns water into wine, identifies with the culture, and allows the guests, and especially the host, not to be embarrassed. In that case, he identified with culture. He sought to bring truth to every situation, not based on cultural norms, but based on biblical, scriptural truth. Jesus did not let culture distort his view of people and their need of salvation. This is something we do often. We believe if we go into a bar, we will be polluted by the environment, even though there's people in the bar that need to hear the message of Jesus Christ. If we frequent a locale of a certain reputation, we feel that reputation is going to follow us all the way home. However, Jesus was the friend to publicans and sinners and was seen at their parties and seen at their homes and probably frequented, if there were, the bars and the sordid establishments of that culture because there's people there who need the message of Christ. It used to be taught in our churches, especially in the South, that if you frequented a person of a different color, you were a sinner and you were not paying attention to biblical norms. You needed to separate from those type of people. And holy cow, if you married a person of a different color, you committed an unpardonable sin. But that's just a cultural reference that has nothing to do with biblical truth. You, you're not a sinner if you go to a liquor if you go into a, a grocery store which sells liquor, and you're not a sinner if you play cards at your home in your living room. Those are things that Jesus would try to transform. But the way you judge people and the way you interact with people and judge them because of their style or their lifestyle or their vocation. That is a sin, and Jesus would transform that. And he would get in your face and tell you so. At times, the very people we are to identify with, those who are lost and have no, no hope, are the ones we're most quickly and most likely to separate from. And Jesus would challenge that purview. If you want to learn Jesus, 
Learn how he dealt with culture. Don't assume that you were redeemed just because you met the cultural standard. The cultural standard is you need to just say a prayer and ask Jesus to come into your life, and then you're saved. Jesus never stated that in Scripture. He always stated that a person was forgiven, their sins were cleansed, go in peace. After they demonstrated faith in him, humility, and demonstrated a life of repentance, a change of character. And then he rewarded them with, you are saved, your sins are forgiven. And we should think likewise. Do our lives demonstrate the change? Do they demonstrate that we're willing to talk to the person who is culturally different, who is black or Vietnamese or Muslim? and who has a different culture and a different way of thinking, can we enter that situation and live a questionable life? Culture tells us to separate ourselves from people. Jesus never separated himself from people, especially those who were humble and repentant. And he did not let culture define them. He didn't assume that those who were correct culturally had soft hearts either. He judged each person by their response to him. And he was gentle to those who believed, and he was stern to those who disbelieved. And he tried to transform their worldview. Jesus doesn't view us through the lens of culture. He looks directly into our heart and sees whether it's soft or hard. If we live a questionable life, we will have soft hearts. To learn Jesus, we must be a student of culture. Therefore, we must not allow the culture to determine what is right or wrong. We determine what is right or wrong from the truth found in Scripture. We must not assume a person is irredeemable because she or he doesn't measure up to the cultural standard. And we must identify ourselves with people and not separate from them because they are different from us, and we just don't like them. May God infuse us with his attitude, and may we have his eyes to deal with culture in a biblical way, the way that he did. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, soften our hearts. Make us people who are willing to change our cultural worldview. Help us to see people from their position, how they're feeling, and their willingness to humble themselves and repent. Help us, Father, be change agents, living questionable lives, because we've learned Jesus and we learned him well. Let us not put people in boxes and to define them by cultural norms, but let us open up the box and bring to them the wonderful message of salvation so that they can receive it if they are intended to by your grace. In the name of Jesus, amen.